Welcome back to the story of Fatima. One of the writers on Fatima, Father DeMarkey, explains why Lucy's mother was so harsh on Lucy. We cannot, of course, as he says, uh, justify what her mother did or how she treated her daughter when this happened, when Our Lady appeared, but we can try to understand. And that is, he says, they were people of ordinary means. Now, when the people came to the COVID era, it was the ground, it was the land belonging to the family. And there they grew their beans and, and olives and, and uh, other food and vegetables, and it was all trampled down. They couldn't, they couldn't eat. And so even Lucy's mother would say, uh, if, you, uh, if you want to eat, eat what, what grows in the kova. And they would blame Lucy, the whole family would blame Lucy for their loss of food and, and things they needed in order to survive. So that's why Lucy's mother was so harsh towards uh, Lucy. And it continued for months. It was only until, it was only in August that she started to change her attitude. After um, Jacinta gave her that branch of on which Our Lady's foot had stepped, had stat, stat, stood upon, in which she expelled this marvelous heavenly uh, perfume. But the hardship for the family was, was real. Her older sisters used to weave and sew, but now they had to take care of the, take part of their time to take care of the sheep because of all the visitors that were talking to Lucy and, and to them. They had hardly time, to, they had to, had a hard time even to take care of their sheep. Finally, they had to sell the sheep them, itself because they, had, they, they couldn't take care of them. And so we understand uh, Lucy's mother's, at least in part, her attitude. Now, uh, because of their attitude, uh, even neighbors and, and would, would taunt Lucy and even strike her as if she were an evil person and she was not protected by her family. Whereas that would never happen to Jacinta and Francesco because Tai Marto, their father, uh, kept an eye on them at all times and would never let that happen to his children. But Jacinta, in her, um, in her urge to make sacrifices, she said to Lucy one day, she said, I wish my parents were more like yours so that people would hit me so I could offer this sacrifice for the conversion of sinners. And so, and this is of course added to by the ridicule poured on them by the press and of course by people like uh, Arturo de Santos, the, the, the tinsmith, the mayor of Urem, the one who put them in jail. You could, you could see, understand how these children were being formed in the crucible of suffering, persecution from their family, mostly Lucy and her family, although sometimes Jacinta's mother reproached her. And Jacinta, in her turn, said, Mother, you must be careful. You might, if you don't believe, you have to, you have to pay. Uh, God will cause you to, to suffer yourself if you, don't, uh, if you don't believe as well. So that's why we, we should remember that even though when we tell our friends and some of them don't believe us or don't think that Fatima is important, we should remember Jacinta and and Lucy and Francesco and not worry about people's reaction and offer up that, that trial, that sacrifice to Our Lady uh, for the conversion of sinners. We will talk, we'll continue now to tell you what happened in September when Our Lady came back for the fifth time. Welcome back to the story of Fatima. Before we talk about Our Lady's appearance on September 13th, we should talk about the crowd for a moment. That day on October th uh, other. On October 13th, on September, before we talk about, I'll start again. Okay. Welcome back to the story of Fatima. Before we talk about the apparition of Our Lady on September 13th, we should talk about how many people were there. There were 30,000 people, 30,000 people. They came from all walks of life. They were ordinary people, poor people, and very rich people. Even nobility were there. The children could hardly get out of their houses to walk to the operation site. There was people everywhere, and they all wanted to talk to them. They all wanted to ask for, to, to ask Our Lady for a cure for a, a sick child, one who was deaf or one who was blind, or for the cure for their own health. 
from tuberculosis, for example, and so forth. Or that their brother or their father or their husband come back safe from the war. They had, uh, it was almost impossible for them to get, make any progress to get there. People were even climbing from the trees and calling from, uh, from behind walls and so forth to ask for these favors. Finally, some people came to, uh, came to their help and cleared away for them to walk to the Kova. It was about uh, several miles from, from, their, from their home in Al Jastrel. And so, first of all, you see the uh, people that come from much further away and also with much more faith. Um, they'd also um, seen the, the, uh, and heard reports of how the children had been kidnapped and so forth. And the second thing we should notice about the, uh, September 13th is that uh, a number of things were seen by the people more than ever before. First of all, there were more visitors, but secondly, some, a lot of people saw, well, as Our Lady was appearing, petals, rose petals, or flower, petals of flowers falling down from the sky. And when they went to touch them or went to catch them, they would disappear just before they would fall in their hands or disappear just before they fell on the ground, these petals. But more than that, some people saw a marvelous globe of light descending at the time the children said Our Lady was appearing. And when the children announced that Our Lady was going back, some of the same people saw the globe going off in the direction uh, that Our Lady said she was going. Uh, a number of people, including priests, saw this phenomenon. The third thing is, is again, the stars. And, and the sun went dim, so dim, that at noontime, the people could see the stars as if it was almost night, and yet it was, there was no eclipse, and there was, there was nothing obstructing the sun at all. But yet they could see the stars at noon. So all these things were given as signs to the people t to recognize that truly the Mother of God was appearing there. Now, what happened when the children saw Our Lady? Again, the children, Lucy asked again, what does Your Excellency want of me? And again, Our Lady told her to come on October 13th and that she would work a miracle and that St. Joseph would come with the child Jesus, and that the Our Lady of Sorrows would come, and that Our Lady of the Rosary would come. And uh, she also said, God is pleased with your sacrifices, but do not wear the rope at night. It is too difficult for you. And then she asked for prayers for various people, and, and Our Lady say, some will, will improve over the year. Others, our Lord does not trust, and he will not cure. So, the children were again reminded about the use of the money for making letters to make a procession of Our Lady so that Our Lady again spoke about processions and building a chapel in, uh, in the Kova in commemoration of her visits there. This apparition was very brief, one of the briefest of all of them, but at the same time Our Lady was emphasizing the point she'd already made. Of course, she told the children to pray the rosary, to pray the rosary of the day, to obtain peace for the world. So these people, these 30,000 people, of course, told their friends and neighbors. And that is why in October, there were 70,000 people, even more than ever come before. 70,000 is about the size of Jerusalem was when they crucified Christ there. 70,000 people came to October 13th, and we'll talk about that shortly. But first I'd like to talk about the spirit of the children a little more and their desire for prayers and sacrifices. The most striking thing Our Lady had said to them in, October, in August was many people, many souls go to hell because they have no one to pray and make sacrifices for them. And this was echoed by Pope Pius XII in his encyclical The Mystical Body of Christ when he said, it is a great mystery but nevertheless true that the number of souls saved depends on how well Catholics correspond, cooperate with God's grace. It's another way of Our Lady saying, it depends, many souls go to hell because no one prays and makes sacrifices. The first sacrifice, of course, 
as the angel taught the children was to accept the sacrifices that God sent you in your lifetime. And of course, our Lord himself explained to Lucy in the convent that the first sacrifice was to do our daily duty. And of course, to do our daily duty is to do what we're what work we're supposed to do or what for, for children we're supposed to study and obey our parents uh, to do what is given to us in life to do that is uh, our daily duty and to of course to avoid the occasions of sin St. Alphonsus tells us that if we avoided the occasions of sin almost all mortal sins would not be committed the number one cause of sin is not avoiding the occasions of sin the occasions of sin are any person, place or thing that is likely to cause us to sin those persons, places, and things can be avoided, and thus we can avoid falling into sin. And of course, to avoid sin, we also need to pray. As St. Alphonse explains, he who prays will be saved, he who does not pray will be lost. We need to pray in order to get the graces we need in order to be good. That's why Our Lady insisted every time she came at Fatima to pray the rosary every day. So when our, the children remembered these words of Our Lady, Many souls go to help because they have no one to pray for them and make sacrifices. They, of course, increase their prayers. They increase their prayers. They would pray the prayers Our Lady taught them, pray the prayers the angel taught them. When they went to the Cabezo, which is closer than the Koba, to take care of the sheep, they would say the prayer that the angel taught them. O oh my God, I adore Thee, I believe in Thee, I hope in Thee, and I love Thee. I ask pardon for all those who do not adore Thee, who do not believe in Thee, who do not hope in Thee, who do not love Thee. That's the first prayer the angel taught them. And they said this prayer prostrate, lying flat on the ground and saying it for a long time. Other times they would say the other prayer the angel taught them, which was almost Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I adore thee profoundly. I offer up to thee the most precious body and blood, soul and divinity of the same Son, Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world in reparation for all the blasphemies, outrages, and indifferences by which he is offended. And I draw upon the infinite merits of the most sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, that you might convert for sinners. They said this prayer for hours as well, prostrate on the ground. They said this prayer for hours because and said this prostrate on the ground. Other times they said the prayer that Our Lady, the first prayer Our Lady taught them, Almost Holy Trinity, I adore thee. My God, my God, I love thee in the most blessed sacrament. And then again, other times they would pray, the prayer Our Lady taught them to pray at the end of each decade of the rosary. O my Jesus, it's for love of thee, for the conversion of sinners, and reparation of sins against the Immaculate Heart. Now besides prayer, they made sacrifices. Now, one time when some of the pilgrims asked uh, Francesco, uh, what did Our Lady say? He said, did they tell you to pray for sinners? And he said, yes. And Lucy contradicted him. She said, no, she didn't ask us to pray. She didn't say that. And Francesco asked her afterwards, what do you mean she did say that? Well, she said, pray and make sacrifices for sinners. She didn't just ask us to pray. She said to pray and make sacrifices for sinners. It reminds me of the story of the Curie of Ars. One time, a parish priest, not far from Ars, not far from the village where the, the Curie of Ars lived, came to him and said, why does God not hear my prayers for the conversion of the village sinner? And I've been praying a long time for him. And the curie said, have you fasted for him as well? And the, the parish priest said, no, I haven't done that. Well, add fasting to your prayers and see what happens. And a few weeks later, the parish priest came to the cure of ours and said, my sinner has been converted. So when Lucy said, I didn't ask us just to pray for sinners. She asked us to pray and make sacrifices for sinners. It's important as it's illustrated by the lives of the saints as well. And so the children not only prayed, but they also offered sacrifices. They offered many sacrifices, not only wearing that rope, which was so difficult and so rough on them. And they wore it not just during the apparitions, but even Francesco, just before he died, one of the last things he did was to give the rope back to Lucy so there's, their parents would not know he had it. In fact, their sacrifices they did, they did only, only let each other know, and their lady, they kept it hidden from everyone else. It was only years later when Lucy was commanded to write down the memoirs that under holy obedience, she revealed all the sacrifices that they did. And so our sacrifices should not be done
for others to see, but should be done rather as something for God to see. Just like our Lord said, when you pray, hide yourself in your room so that people don't see you. We don't want, we don't want to do these things so that others would notice them and praise us for them. And the children didn't want to do them in front of others so that we'd be stopped from making their sacrifices. But they made many sacrifices, going without water, going without food. In fact, they would give away their lunch and give it to others, to children. And even when they were very, very hungry and they were about to get, uh, say, take a, a stack of grapes that they had, someone had given them, then they saw somebody who, was, who needed to eat and they gave it to them and would continue to fast for the day, throughout the day, so no one would notice that they weren't eating. And they would, of course, eat at home at night. Anyway, they made many sacrifices, and it's important for us to keep this in mind. Next time, we will talk about what happened on October 13th. Welcome back to the story of Fatima. Talking about the 13th of September apparitions, we should give you the testimony of a Monsignor John Quaresima. He was a vicar general of the Diocese of Lira, where Fatima is located. He was a man of great learning, and he went with his friend, Father Manuel Carmo Goyas. He didn't know whether to believe in the apparitions or not. He describes his state of mind on the 13th of September before I went there. Have the children been deceived? Or is there any truth in what the children say? And what are we to make of the extraordinary crowds that are going there each month? These were some of the questions he had as he went there himself. Father Goyas had chosen a spot uh, which was far enough back, but on the on sort of like a top of a hill overlooking the whole amphitheater of the crowd and where the children were. It was quite a good place to be. He had gone there in a uh, in a carriage, in a horse drawn carriage, an old horse. It was very slow, he said, but. They didn't get too close, but from this vantage point, he started to hear people around him um, telling others to look in the sky to see something extraordinary. So he too looked in the sky and he too could see what they saw. What he saw was a luminous globe going across the sky from east to west. It was gliding slowly and majestically through space. His friend also looked up, Father Goyas, and he too could see this globe. At some point, it disappeared. He didn't see it anymore. But he could still hear a child about the age of Lucy, dressed in similar clothes as Lucy, right beside him, saying that she could still see this globe. And the same girl spoke of the globe going back after the apparitions were over. And he too could see. And he asked his friend, the priest, Father Goyas, what do you think? He said, it was a chariot in which Our Lady was coming. We weren't graced to see Our Lady, but we could see the chariot that she went in. It's a very unusual. Also, I remember meeting another priest of that diocese, there were very few priests on that day, but there's some, one of them who was a seminarian at the time who became the best friend or one of the best friends of, of the bishop who had taught uh, the bishop to get Sister Lucy to write down the secret in 1944. He too saw this chariot, if I recall, Canon Galamba. And uh, the friend, Father Goyes, went from group to group of people, pilgrims, on the way back and asked them if they'd seen this chariot. And they too all told him that they'd seen it as well. So it was quite widely seen and something that is reported here in the book by Father DeMarkey. We'll continue with our story of Fatima and what happened on October in a few minutes. Welcome back to the story of Fatima. October 13th was approaching we need to understand what was going on at the time. We must remember, first of all, Our Lady promised a miracle in July, again in August, again in September. 
always pointing to the 13th of October for the great miracle. She promised a big miracle so that all might see and believe. A big miracle was approaching, and what was happening in the village, what was happening in their families as a result of this, and what was happening in, in the country. They, of course, the unbelievers sneered and said, it's a big hoax, it's not going to happen, it's just the imagination of these children. The enemies of the church were rejoicing. They were saying, it can't happen, not something like this, miracles don't happen, and not big miracles seen by everybody. It can't happen. And they were rejoicing because then the church would look bad and people would stop believing. And they were, they were re already licking their chops, so to speak, at the prospect of being able to embarrass the church and prove it was just a big hoax, the church itself. Now the children were saddened by this reaction of unbelief by so many people, but they were not afraid they were sure Our Lady would do what she said. They were confident in Our Lady's goodness and Our Lady's power. Nothing could shake them from that. But their families was something quite different. In their families, particularly in the family of Lucy, they were terror-struck. Then they were tormented. They were being threatened by their neighbors that if nothing happened, that they might be killed, not just... Lucy, but the whole family. Maria de Angelos, the oldest sister of Lucy, said later, my family was extremely worried, extremely worried. The closer the day came, the more we insisted with Lucy that she give up this dream of hers, that we would all have to suffer because of her imaginings. This is what was going on in her family. Your father scolded her, but never struck her. But we couldn't say the same about our mother. Some people suggested to us that we should lock the children in their rooms until they confessed that it was all a fake. We didn't know what to do. We didn't speak about these things in front of Lucy very much, but we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what was going to happen to us. We were frightened. Lucy's mother one day came to the children at the well and she said, tell me quietly that it didn't take place. Tell me quietly and I'll just go and tell the priest. Can I tell that to the priest? Lucy said nothing. But Jacinta spoke up very quietly with tears in her eyes. And she said, you can do what you want, but we saw. On the morning of the 12th of October, Lucy's mother got up with a bolt. She was panic stricken. She jumped out of bed, she ran to Lucy, and she said, come, let us go to confession. Tomorrow we're going to be killed, but nothing happens. They'll kill us if there's no miracle. Lucy said to her, I'll be happy to go with you to confession. If you wish to go to confession, I'll accompany you. But I won't go to confession, and, and Our Lady will come, and not to worry, everything will be fine. But, of course, her sisters and her mother continued to worry and thought they would be killed. Now, things were different at the Marto home. Ty Marto, the father of the seven children of, and of, Luce, uh, of Jacinta and Francesco, nothing could shake his belief in what would happen. Yet, people would come to his home and try to discourage him and discouraged his children. Even a priest came who was convinced it was all a hoax. And he was quite an intelligent man. And he tried by tricks. He said, well, whether you say it or not, I will just go and report it that they've said it and then no one will come. Tamarto said, you of course are free to do what you want. The 
The man who came with the priest said, this is nothing but witchcraft. He wanted to talk to Lucy and Francesco, but they were away when this priest came. But he went to the Jacinta and he said, listen, Jacinta, Lucy has already told me it's all a hoax, that she made it all up. And Jacinta was just as insistent in saying, no, she didn't say that. And it's not a hoax. And the priest continued to insist, and Jacinta was just as firm and just as insistent. This and many things like this were going on to try to shake the children from their determination to be faithful to Our Lady, but nothing would move them. And so it came that the 13th itself uh, came, and what a day it was. The heavens had opened, and it was raining. It was raining so much. It was the same rainfall, apparently, that was falling in Passchendaele at the time of the uh, battle going on there, in which the people, were, the soldiers were mired in mud. And it was like that in Fatima. The rain came so much that the fields were full of water and mud. People in that day, when they came to Fatima, were standing, some of them, in mud up to their ankles because of the rainfall. It didn't, for, didn't seem to be the kind of day, the glorious day, that they expected. Nevertheless, the rains came and the people came. 70,000 people came. We will talk about what happened on October 13th in our next program. Remember to pray the rosary every day. God bless you. Pregate, pregate molto e sacrificatevi per i peccatori. Molte anime vanno all'inferno perché non vi è chi si sacrifichi e preghi per loro.